Well, there's a famous proverb that you may or may not have heard before, and it says this, no man is completely worthless. He can always serve as a bad example. Now, as true and as terrible as that can be, we do know that there are many people in life that are worth emulating that live great examples as well as those who are not. I was blessed in my life, and I've spoken of it before, to have my grandfather in my life. He was a newspaper editor in the Florida Times Union, went on later to found Ryan's Steakhouse, worked hard, was successful, cared about his family, cared about his employees, but most importantly, he demonstrated a life and a love for Christ. And so even at his death and in his funeral, dishwashers and individuals I never knew traveled from all over the state to be there because of the impact that he had. And that's a great example in my life. I've had lots of bad examples as well. And usually I jump to Hitler, but I feel like with the Ukraine news, we should just pick on Putin for a while. But nonetheless, pick your poison. Putin or Hitler, either one is a bad example. Seizing power, causing violence, uh, restricting freedoms, holding grudges, having an overly extreme sense of national pride. These are dangerous things and bad things to emulate. And we find the same thing throughout Scripture. In our walk in Chronicles, we've seen this over and over again. The kings who are good, the ones who are great to follow, and the ones, no, don't do what they've done. We find guys like Cain, bad. And then we find guys like James, who's written the letter we're reading, a good example. But even with Cain and James and King David and Jehoshaphat and whoever else you might name, there's only one that was actually, and still is, the perfect example. And of course, that's Jesus himself. God made manifest. He's the very foundation of of our faith. He's the example of what a perfect life looks like and what it is to be. And so James gives us tonight three ways of living that every Christian should follow if we're going to demonstrate a life that follows after and seeks to mirror who Christ is. We're going to find that we're never to show partiality, never dishonor the poor, and ending with never failing to love our neighbor. If we'll live according to those directives, we'll show that our faith is truly grounded in Christ. And when we are gone, the legacy we live behind will be one that lasts and changes lives for the glory of God. So I invite you to open up your copy of God's Word, if you haven't already, to James chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. And as we do each time that we open, we remind ourselves that there is only one place in this entire universe where we can go to find absolute truth, and it is the Bible. It is the very Word of God, every single word of it inspired by Him. It is an errant meaning it has no error, so what it says is true is true. And it's infallible meaning it will never, ever fail, so we can trust it completely. So hear now the Word of the Lord from James Chapter 2, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. And the people said, 
And let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to hear from you what you have. Cause our souls to be at peace. Let us to not be distracted, but hear only you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we said, James is going to teach us how to have a life that's truly demonstrating a life following Christ. He's going to show us how that is done. And the first way we do that is by having a life in which we never show partiality. And we're told, commanded, to not show that partiality. But in order to do this, to obey that command, we need to understand what does that mean? What does it mean to show no partiality? Some people say favoritism. Don't show favoritism. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, the very definition of the word used is being biased. Partiality is being biased or having a liking for or giving a preference to. That's what having a partiality is. This could be as simple as saying, I'm partial to pepperoni pizzas, but not to pizzas with vegetables on it. That's my partiality. It could be we are partial to hymns and not contemporary music. We're partial to pews and not the stadium chairs you see in places. We're partial to all sorts of different things in life. There can be many, many ways and areas in which we have our own partiality, our own favoritism. And what we need to realize is that not all partiality, not all favoritism or preferential treatment is wrong and sinful. In fact, some of those are necessary and they're proper and they're required, in fact, even commanded in Scripture. Alistair Begg gave a great example of this when he worked through this text. And he said, first, consider an elderly lady. The Bible tells you to respect your elders, and that means even in age, not just in the office, and to respect those who are older. And so one way in which that would be done is say there's a seat that needs to be given up by a younger person. It's expected and it's proper the younger person would give up their seat for the older person to show that favoritism, show that partiality, because we're showing honor. That's a command in Scripture. It's right to have that partiality. You can look at another example for those who've served in the military. There are times we speak about that and we recognize them for their service. They've served honorably and we want to say, thank you for what you've done. And there's nothing wrong with recognizing that. We see that throughout Scripture constantly, men who are praised for their service to their countries and their being mighty men of valor. And so we do that. There's even the proper place and decorum and procedure if the President of the United States were to arrive. If he were to come here to visit, it would be proper to have a certain way things would be done, a certain place he would sit. We'd expect for safety and protocol and methods that things would just have to take place. And that's proper and that's right. The Bible tells us to honor the emperors, to show them this respect. So that's not the kind of partiality that James is speaking of here. The partiality James is talking about is darker. It's more evil. It's more sinister. It's much more heart-driven. This one is based not on what's deserved and commanded respect, but simply our own opinion of your value as a person. It's one that is specifically driven by wealth and what you have. And since wealth and the ability to gain wealth is only from God, it's sinful when we begin to assume well, that wealthy person clearly matters more. That's not the case. The Greek word that uh, James makes use of for partiality literally means this, to lift up the face. In other words, it simply means judging someone purely on their outward appearance, looking at what they are and who they are and making every determination about their value, their worth, and their importance. That's the partiality that we're commanded to not do. In high school, I had an odd experience of partiality and favoritism. I was constantly called Bible boy and Jesus guy and God dude and all these other nicknames. 
And people would come to me and say, hey, would you pray for me? Because God likes you, so he'll probably hear what you pray. And I would try to tell people, you know, you can pray to God too. And like, no, 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 no. You're his guy, so you just do it for me and we'll be okay. And then they're like, we know he likes you. And why would they say that? It was pure outside appearance. They knew I went to church. They knew that I would read the Bible. They'd see a Christian t-shirt I had on. They just made that assumption. But they didn't know the inside heart. God knew that. And I knew that if they knew half of what was inside my heart, they'd stop asking me to pray for them. That was the honest truth. But we're not supposed to show that partiality. And why? Because God himself does not show that partiality. Remember earlier in James, he makes mention of the fact that there is no shadow of turning with God, meaning there is no variance and change. He's not one way here and one way over there. He is not a respecter of persons. Paul says in Romans 2.11, God shows no partiality, using the exact same word that James uses here. Paul would stress in that verse and in that section that before God, all men are guilty of sin. Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, free, slave, didn't matter. You're guilty before God. We're all equal. There you go. You want to find out how we all are on the same level? We're sinners in the hands of an angry God, as Jonathan Edwards would say. God will reward those who obey with life. He, dis he punishes those with wrath, those who disobey. And it's applied irregardless of your background and your supposed status. We even find that same truth declared in Deuteronomy 10 as Moses is reiterating the law to the people. Forty years after the wilderness, that first generation has died off. The new generation about to go into the promised land. And Moses is reminding them of the laws and the commands. He's declaring all the mighty works that God has done for them. And then in the midst of this declaration in chapter 10, he brings up this aspect of God. He says, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial, takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And what we find being told is that God judges justly across the board. And so we have to ask, what does that mean for us? Are we doing the same? Are we judging according to truth or simply according to our own preference and perceived value of another person? Do we just look at them and determine, based on what we think of them, whether they're adding any value to our group or our society, our nation, our world, whatever it may be? Or are we simply saying, you're also a sinner who needs God, just like I am a sinner who needs God? And I have to say, I think you'd agree, it's great that we have a God who is not a respecter of persons. Because I can tell you, if that was the case, I'd be in a really sad state. And I'm glad that that's not true. He's truly just, he's truly merciful. And so to have a proper life, one that demonstrates Christ truly, then we must never show partiality, judging on these outward appearances. That judging part with partiality, of course, naturally leads, as James takes us, to our next point, which is we must never dishonor the poor. And he uses a lot of colorful language here. He talks about the gold ring and fine clothing and shabby clothing on the other person. When you look into the actual imagery and the Greek that he is using, He's really stating that this person comes in with golden rings on every single finger and that his clothes are glowing and that they shine. That's who this person is. I was talking about it earlier with Lindsay and she says, you mean like Tom Brady? I said, yeah, I guess like Tom Brady. He has rings on every finger. But something like that comes in. And the other one, it's a filthy, stinking, rotting kind of cloth. 
It's your homeless person who's probably been homeless their entire existence. They've never taken a bath. They've never washed anything. And these two individuals come in at the same time. So we'll say Tom Brady comes in from this door. The homeless guy comes in from this side. And James says, suppose that happens, and then suppose, as they do, you look at the rich, wealthy individual and say to him, hey, come sit with me, come sit right up here, it's a great spot. And you tell the homeless guy, now you, just as far back as you can, or just sit on the ground, I don't want you to dirty up our pews, because that might stain, and we can't get it out. And James says, suppose that happens. And putting that image in the minds of the readers, he then asks a question that is expected we would all agree with. He then asks, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And naturally we'd say, yeah, that's, when you put it that way, that does sound pretty wrong. You're right. Of course it's wrong. But see, there's more at stake here than a seating issue. James is not worried about how you're filling out your seating charts at church or other gatherings. This is a heart issue. It's about being double-minded. Remember earlier in his letter, he's already said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's divided. He has a mind that's doing good and a mind that's doing evil at the same time. These evil thoughts, these twisted, corrupted thoughts are those who think they're religious, but as we saw last week, do not bridle their tongue. All of that coming together. And so he says, clearly that's wrong, and I think we all agree. And we're like, yes, we agree. So then he asks another question. And he says, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who love him? In other words, saying, can't we all look around right now and see how many in the world that are poor have come to him in saving faith? How many poor individuals have repented of their sins, have been given eternal life? And we would all say, well, yes, I know. And some people would say, that's me. I'm one of those. And he says, they are truly rich because they are heirs of the kingdom of God. And that reminds us of what Jesus says in Matthew when he speaks about the day of judgment. He spoke of the outcome for all, whether rich, poor, American, European, Jew, Gentile, whatever, all who've placed their faith in him, he says, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so irregardless of their financial standing, the poor are made wealthy because of the inheritance they have in the kingdom of God. And so what James is pointing out here is it's not these blessings don't belong to someone simply because they're poor. They belong to someone who has repented, someone who loves Christ. In other words, he's saying, aren't the poor among you as fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, those who also love the same God that you love? And it's an obvious answer of yes. So we know it's wrong to act that way. We know it's also true that the poor have been saved. So then James drops the proverbial hammer in a similar situation, mirroring what happened with King David and Samuel. If you remember with King David and Samuel in 2 Samuel, this is after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. And the prophet approaches the king and tells him this parable and says there's a man who had this sheep, and he really loved this sheep. It was really special to him. But his neighbor had a friend come over, and so they took this guy's sheep and slaughtered it, and they ate it as their meal. And the king gets angry. And David says, take me to this man. We're going to kill him immediately. And Samuel tells him, you're that man, and Bathsheba is that sheep. And he explains the whole thing to David. And James does the same thing in this scenario. Because then, verse 6 and 7, what he says after stating, isn't it wrong to treat him this way? And hasn't God saved the poor? And then he says, but you dishonor the poor man. He goes, aren't the rich the ones who oppress you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which 
you were called? Literally, what he says at the end is, aren't they the ones who blasphemed the name which was spoken over you? And see, that's important to understand. When you joined the church back then, and you still hear of it, people would receive a Christian name, a name given to them under Christ. And so what James is saying is, aren't they the ones who blaspheme Jesus himself? At your baptism, you're baptized into Christ and into the name of Christ, and yet the very ones you want to show partial treatment to, that you want to give favor to, are the same ones blaspheming your Savior, while the one who loves your Savior and is called by the same name, you're telling to sit in the back or just stay off your furniture. It's a very interesting structure that James uses. And James is no longer playing games with his audience, as we see. He's very serious. There's a great example found. And he says, we've got to pay attention to this. But like David, like the audience originally of James's time and us today, we find that we are often trapped by our own words and our own admissions. And when we're not careful, when we don't watch over ourselves, we can find that we become guilty of that same dishonor. And we find ourselves sitting under that correction and realizing how much we've gone astray. And that's why having your faith grounded in Christ means that we are never to dishonor the poor. Why we're to not show partiality. But then all of that leads to the broader principle that James wants to get to. And that's simply this. Having our faith grounded in Christ, having a life that seeks to be demonstrated after Him, we must never fail to love our neighbor. As he calls it there, he says, if you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture. And so we see that an acknowledgement that there is a potential for godly obedience still. What James is telling us is there is still this opportunity. And treating the rich well who oppress and blaspheme, he says it's possible that you can still do this properly. He says in this case, if you're doing it out of love, if you're doing it out of obedience to God, then you're doing it properly. You're doing it good. It's fine. He wants you to understand, don't look at someone who's wealthy and immediately say, well, I need to just bash that guy. How dare they have wealth? I should attack them. That's not where James is going with this. Some people take James's letter and they use it incorrectly. We're not supposed to see someone who's well off and instantly demean them. The point James is saying is if you simply do this out of favoritism, then a quick turn needs to be made. You need to confess the transgression. And I can tell you this is hard because our own pride, our own self-comfort, our own preferences can really make a mess of loving our neighbors and loving them well. I can recall far too often homeless outreach events that would be held and I would be at and then we'd say let's go pray for this person and I didn't really want to do it because it meant I had to touch them and I knew they hadn't showered and their clothes were dirty and that's terrible I remember another time sitting in the theater just to watch a movie and this guy sits down next to me and he smelled horribly it was the worst and instead of showing compassion and thinking, you know, maybe that's a medical issue. Maybe there's something wrong and he just can't control it. I should just show love for my neighbor and be nice and compassionate. I mean, I was already ordained at this point. You're a pastor. Behave yourself. Instead, I broke off pieces of popcorn and tried to stick them in my nose to see if I could smell that instead of the man. It is a, it's terrible. And I wish I could say that I've always shown love and concern for others, but that's not been the case. In those moments, I show partiality. In those moments when I've dishonored the poor, when I've not loved my neighbor as myself, 
God brings James back into my mind, brings these words back into my heart. When I'll see someone else mistreated, when I see them being unjustly uh, judged and cast out and people showing preference and partiality against them, and I immediately get ready to tell them why they're terrible people for doing that, I remember these things. I find like King David that I'm also guilty. And that's why we have to understand that while James is giving us directions and commands and steps on what to do and how to live and the right way to do things, none of that matters if our hearts have not been changed in the first place. It matters very little if you go out there and become the nicest neighbor that's ever lived, if your heart is still far from God. How many times have we seen that as in Chronicles alone? He did what was right, but his heart was far from God. It can happen. The heart needs to change. So since our faith needs to be grounded in Christ, we must never be partial, we must never dishonor the poor, we must never fail to love our neighbor. And we know that we can't do this all the time. When we're honest, we understand we won't be perfect. We will fail. We'll find ourselves making those judgments. We'll find ourselves immediately casting somebody off and disregarding them because they don't fit our criteria for who should be welcomed and who should not. It's going to happen. But that's why we have Jesus. And that's why we have the gospel. Paul states in Romans 7, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He goes on and says, I'm battling in this fight. But thanks be to God for Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is great hope. It's great hope because those who have repented of their sins, who have placed their faith in Christ, are truly, fully, and completely justified. There's a chart we use in the new members class, and it shows how you are a slave to sin before Christ. All your sins, your life, good, bad deeds, doesn't matter. You remain a slave to sin and under death. But the moment you repent and come to him, you're justified and given new life. From that point on, you grow. There are good days, there are bad days. You obey well, and sometimes you fail spectacularly. And yet, even in the most heinous of sins, you never lose your justification. You remain in Him forever. He seals you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you to make you holy, to present you perfect before the throne. And when we sin, Jesus is our advocate before the Father. To say, I died for that sin. I died for that sin. So our lives need to be lives of word and deed. They need to be lives that are demonstrated. They're not just internal, they're external as well. We're to let lights shine before all men, proclaiming his love, proclaiming his justice, and overall proclaiming the message of the Lord Jesus Christ by living a demonstrated life of faith and repentance. Here's your takeaway. For those who are outside of Christ, you need to follow his example. What I mean by that is seeing the need of laying down your own life. No, you're not going to lay down your life and earn anything from it but you have to end what you thought you could do your goals your plans your ambitions your attempts at good deeds your measuring enough merit to earn any forgiveness will get you nowhere but if you'll repent if you'll come to him if you'll place your faith fully in him you can and you will be fully forgiven for all eternity and for those in christ it's more of a time of introspection. Ask yourself this, where are you playing favorites? We all struggle with that. 
but where is it? Is it in political scenarios? Is it in economic scenarios? Is it in uh, sports teams? Whatever it may be. What is it that your flesh has allowed to creep up to create partiality and disruptions? And see where that is. Ask the Holy Spirit to grow you and to help you. And he will. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would help us live lives that are not filled with partiality or favoritism. Lord, we, we do love you. We do want to be like you. We want to do what is right and what is pleasing and obedient to your word. And yet, like Paul says, there's this battle that we find within ourselves. Flesh wanting to do one thing and yet our spirits leading us to do another. Holy Spirit, would you help us grow in sanctification? Would you help us to grow in our compassion for others? Would you help us to resist the partiality that is not proper, to resist the favoritism that we tend to see? Lord, would we not look down on someone because of their status and instead look to see, are they brothers and sisters in the Lord? And if so, they are family and they are equal with us. Help us to demonstrate that faith, demonstrate that life for all around. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.